Hi, and welcome to a, another episode from the Rethinking Faith podcast and videocast. I'm your host, Mitch Moyer. I'm joined here tonight again by James Ballard and Mr. Ray Luke. Tonight, we're going to tackle, uh, could be a very controversial time, a, a controversial subject. And so instead of just rambling on for a moment here, I'm going to turn it over to James. And as I turn it over to James, we're going to, we're going to specifically hone in on the title that we're calling it the great mystery of the divine providence. And if you've spent any time within, I, you know, the Christian world or, you know, you, you understand there is a rub when it comes to dealing and talking with divine providence. So what I'm going to do from this point here is shift it over to James and guys take it away and just knock it out and give it your best shot. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Mitch. Hey guys. Good to be back on here again. Yeah. Um, this will be semi-controversial for some people. I think mm. if you're in the interfaith space in the dialogue, like the three of us are, and like a lot of our listeners are, this won't be very um, hard but for people who are securely in within mainstream Judaism or mainstream Christianity, we're going to be bringing some new ideas that may pull people out of their comfort zone. All that said, um, divine providence, like you said, Mitch, is a, is a very difficult concept. It's, it's the understanding that everything that happens is either orchestrated or willed, which are basically the same thing, by God. And, you know, as we're, it's, um, we're just getting through Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, we read Lamentations, and Lamentations speaks about this, that these all these calamities have happened, but God willed them, God allowed them, right? Mm. It, it, it makes mention of this. And in the Jewish world, this is a pretty normal idea. But what I think sometimes people forget is that it applies to everything. Mm. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at how typically we look at the world of Christian thought and how it has been problematic to a Torah, a, a kosher understanding of the New Testament or, uh, or Torah. Yes. Now we're going to kind of take a different perspective. We're going to look at how that all may have been part of God's divine providence, mm. the idea that so it didn't go perfectly, so it was messy. Um, we're going to talk about how it was necessary to take a, a pretty thoroughly pagan world and introduce them to monotheism and the Torah, even if it comes at the cost of, as we will talk about, a lot of bad events and bad interpretations and long uh, seated, uh, deeply seated, um, what would you call it, uh, rivalries, right, as the backdrop between Jewish Christian relationships. But I think we're not the only ones to say this, that we'll see that this is part of God's plan to pull these together. And most fascinating, Ray and I, will, and, and we were talking about this earlier today, is that all of these ideas were hinted at in the Torah in a, in a particular uh, few chapters for the most part. And there's a deep tradition that isn't well known in the Jewish world or in the Christian world for that matter, as, as understood, of how the idea of Joseph is really a blueprint for all that we saw now at this point, thousands of years later, we can look back and say, oh, wow, it was all right there for us. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Amazing. Uh, yeah, man. Um, once again, glad to be here with you guys. Blessings to all. And I uh, hope everyone had an easy fast. Uh, in exciting times. And, and, and I'm very blessed to be here with both uh, you, Mitch, and, and James. Uh, thanks for the introduction, James. Um, so I wanted to say something on that. I, as, as you mentioned, jo Joseph and how he ties into just the, the whole concept of the redemption. Yeah. Right? Um, there's a passage in Exodus 1.5 that says like this. It says, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, meaning that, that Joseph, he... He went first, he went before his brothers into the Galut, into the exile. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, the, when, when the brothers, the entire Jewish people are 
within the tribesmen and, and Yaakov and Jacob, and etc. They're all in them. When they went down to Egypt, Yosef, one of the brothers, was already there and pretty much concealed because of what had already happened. He had already been sold by his brothers. He had already risen to a position in the land, a very high position. He had been, I think, in exile already for 20-something years yeah. uh, in Egypt. And, you know, they came in there. and They didn't see no sign of their brother. Um, even though I, I believe that their sources, as you mentioned earlier, James, that say that they looked for him, um, but he was nowhere to be found. Hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the most amazing things to Joseph, for those who aren't familiar with this idea, um, Joseph was concealed. He had to be concealed in order for him to carry out the mission he had to do. He had to remain concealed. And mm -hmm. the, the tradition that the Vilna Gaon, for those who don't know, it's the uh, the Gaon, uh, he's the genius of Vilna, a, a rabbi, um, ooh, 1700s, early 1700s, who, yes. um, maybe a little bit earlier, he has his, pretty much the most authoritative understanding on the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef. And I mentioned it last time. Um, if you go to the website I'm putting together for these ideas, called thehiddenorchard.com. I'm, I'm putting hints and, and information and this podcast will be there too about this concept, but it's a very little known concept that the story of Joseph is the footprint of this one part, this is the redemptive part of Messiah's job description. We have Messiah, son of David, who will bring the kingdom in, will cross the finish line, but everything prior to that for the most part, thousands of years of time is part of this, the this, this theme of restoration under the banner of what's called Messiah, son of Joseph. And Joseph is, as we'll see in this tradition, he's oriented to bringing the nations in. We'll look at how that worked out historically. Um, he's oriented to paving the way for the kingdom from which, as it says, that all Israel will be saved. But it had to go the route of Messiah ben Yosef, son of Joseph, first, before we get to the son of David. It's this two-step process to bring in the redemption. And most people only think of Messiah, son of David. And they say, oh, you know, this person's Messiah. Like, well, no, we're not in, we haven't been redeemed yet. We're still very much in exile. But you could make a case for the model, which is much more than, it's bigger than just a person. It's, it's an just idea. Yes many people can take part in it's a movement on one level it can manifest as a person on another and i i think and ray you and i have talked about this um in a number of ways yeshua fits the model of the earlier hidden idea of mashiach ben yosef and that's mm -hmm. what i think is uh the most fascinating the rabbis know uh, according to the teachings presented in, in, a, in a midrash in, in, in Exodus Rabbah, to be exact, one five, that the names of the of Jacob's sons all allude to some aspect of the redemption from Egypt, except for the name of Joseph. Joseph's name stands apart from the others. Joseph's name alludes to the final redemption when the Lord will again, Yosef, recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people, according to the pursuit, according to the verse. It says. Why is Joseph alone associated with the final redemption? The following commentary explains why Joseph's marriage saved all his brothers in Egypt. And on that basis, um, his name is associated with the final redemption when Mashiach ben Yosef will gather all the tribes again in the great gathering of the nations. It says like this, to quote uh, the, 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 the source from Gavul ben Yamin. It says like this, on the basis of the name of Yosef, the Holy One, blessed be he, saved them from Egypt and will again, Yosef, redeem Israel from the kingdoms, as it is written. On that day, the Lord will gather again, Yosef, recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people. We have previously written in several places that the redemption from Egypt was a sign and important for the ultimate redemption, meaning the sages say that Egypt, uh, in, in, in the, the exile of Egypt is like all the exiles combined and that the final redemption will be likened to the to the exile of Egypt, it says. Yep. So it says, as in Micah 7, 15, as in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Ultimately, the bearer of good news will come to proclaim the redemption. 
Mashiach ben Yosef will gather the exiles of Israel. This is why Yosef went down to Egypt first in order to prepare shelter for Israel, a place of refuge for them, provisions for them, and to sustain them. Thus it is written, all the souls who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, Exodus 1.5. The 70 souls endured only because of what is written next. And the text says like this, they, they quote the pursuit, but Yosef was already in Egypt. If it had not been so, they would never have been able to rise or be redeemed from there. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, man. So, you know, like you said, uh, uh, James, it's, it's very interesting, and we were talking about this earlier, that Yosef, among all, in contrast to any of the other brothers, is the only one that has a Goyish name, a name from among the Gentiles, yep. okay? As, as he rose, according to divine providence, um, we have to understand the Hasidic concept that even the bad, not just the good, um, but we have to understand that even the bad things that happen to us, which is very difficult, also comes from God. Yeah. And only a person with high levels of amuna can grasp this. Yosef clearly grasped that. Yep. And um, it mm. is said that he was given a new name, Safna Paneach. It was given to him by, by power, was it not? By Pharaoh. Mm. Okay. And so none of the other brothers have another name. Benjamin is Benjamin, Yehuda is Yehuda. They don't have another name. It's only mm. Yosef. Um, and it's so interesting that Yeshua ben Yosef, okay, that's his name, his father's mm -hmm. name is Yosef ben Yaakov is his father's name. Okay? It's, it's, it so happens that Yeshua ben Yosef has come to be known among the nations as Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth whatever you want to call him, it sounds like a different name. He's oh. under a different type of system, right? A Roman system. And he looks nothing to his, to his brothers of what he should look like. Here's right. this contrast. And, it's, and, and, and forget about me trying to say that he's connected to Mashiach ben Yosef or whatever. Clearly, he has messianic connections. Whether people like him or not, whether he wasn't the Messiah or is, I'm not talking about that. Right. I can show various sources here from rabbis who actually do connect Yeshua, though they don't believe in him. They connect Yeshua with Mashiach ben Yosef. Sure. Okay. In positive ways. Um, uh, uh, um, Rabbi David Vahe. Okay. Uh, Abu Lafia, uh, the, the great Kabbalist. He Abu also Abu. does this. Um, uh, Rabbi Shimshon of Ostropoli. Also mm -hmm. says that Yeshua, talking about Yeshua, the historical Yeshua of Nazareth, says that Yeshua of Nazareth was the Mashiach of the other side. Right. Meaning, just like Yosef who fell into the other side, so this same din has happened to this person. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, that's neither here nor there, not trying to say anything, but it fits the mold. Divine providence is clearly there. Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg has come out to say that one of the main missions of Mashiach ben Yosef is that he is to go to the nations. Yeah. You, you just mentioned one of the great expounders of this concept of Mashiach ben Yosef, which is not just to one person. Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, it speaks about first and foremost of a force that's in all things, exactly. a redemptive force. Okay, that's in, in that's in people, that's in that's in places, that's in a lot of things. The, it's a force, and it's also a movement, a, a, a movement, a, a, a process. Yep. There's the Mashiach, Mashiach ben Yosef process, and the Mashiach ben David process, and then there is a, there are individuals who fit the mold throughout the generations. This this soul is sort of like recycled, and there will be the Mashiach ben Yosef. And the Mashiach ben David, the individual who will fulfill, finally fulfill this with the help of Hashem, of course, um, how this thing will go. Well, the Vilna Gaon says that, referring to what Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg said, that uh, Mashiach ben Yosef is geared towards the nations, to the Gentiles. The Vilna Gaon says that Yonah was the Mashiach ben Yosef of his generation, and he was sent out to the nations to make them do tshuva, to make them repent. Isn't Never. that amazing? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And just before you leave that, that's that's what some would argue, some learned in, in the uh, New Testament understanding as a Jewish source, that's the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah is the nations repenting. Repenting, yes. And the sign yes. of Jonah is the the movement of Mashiach and Yosef, who the sages say is Jonah. Mm -hmm. um, Amazing. Right? So Amazing. you see, when you when you understand like like Ray has been saying, there are very deep concepts here, and we're kind of we're kind of not getting into them. We probably couldn't ever get into them in any kind of uh justi justified amount of time yeah. because it would take forever. But you start to see that the New Testament is either it got really lucky accidentally stumbling <laughs> into these traditions, or they may have had some kind of understanding that we're just now beginning to see emerge for the first time in thousands of years. Right. And that's the question I think we were asking people to look at today is maybe <clears throat> rethink the way you approach these, because it seems like they have the upper hand to that tradition that only a few of us are really starting to find and, and you know, with God's help, begin to understand it. It says that, you know, no one is, so these, these elaborations or these secrets have only come out through, um, through time yeah. as the Masora has been, you know, since the time the Masora was codified at Yavne, coming down through subsequent generations of Tzadikim and sages, all the way, Kabbalist, all the way down to our time. It's so, but, but the, the history of Yeshua and the, the, the codifications of the teachings of this rabbi only came, were way before this, okay? Yep. These things happened way before that. So no one can say that, that, that Yeshua is being plagiarized in order to fit the mold of things that happened that, that weren't recorded till way later. Yeah. What am I talking about? The Zohar, um, which, which of course, many, many, many Kabbalists and many rabbis explain that it, it's, it comes down from the first century, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe so. Um, there is this. There is this text that says there is this concept that Mashiach ben Yosef is supposed to. He's supposed to be revealed from where? This is incredible. The Mashiach ben Yosef is supposed to be revealed from the Galilee. Yeah. And and I'm sorry. Who is from the Galilee? Who, who was raised there? Who was who was from there? Who was known as the Galilean? Yeah. I mean, th these things are incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Rabbi Sadia Gaon says this, that Mashiach ben Yosef will be revealed and he will dwell in the Galilee, in the Galilee regions. The Zohar says this. Mm -hmm. Right. And it makes you, you know, when you look at the New Testament in that regard, maybe that's the reason they continue to hammer. That's where he comes from. They keep dropping that word so much that it's one of them. The, obviously, it's one of the biggest tourist places for Christians because they know what the Galilee is. Through the New Testament, and again, is it is it luck, or did they have some kind of understanding of this tradition, right? Of course, um, of course. You think of the, the discussion Yeshua has with Nathaniel. Is it? He says, uh, "What you know?" And he, he's talking to some students in, of John, and they say, "Hey, what good could what could come from the Galilee?" Right? Kind of a a comment, but he he gives him a little hint of a tradition which is also in the Zohar talking about the son of man and then the ladder to heaven and the angels coming up and down. And it's, again, you're, you're, you're seeing that these people had a very deep understanding of these concepts. Yep. And it goes back to this, this Mashiach ben Yosef character. Um, one thing I think is fascinating, Ray, you said this earlier, it's a movement. So historically, historically, when you look, back at something you can start to see okay this is the year that this happened and this is the year that this event happened and this is an era and this is an era right but when you're in those moments when you're living through those experiences things happen we know this in our own lives it's it's much more transitional when the people of israel came out of egypt they weren't ready to go right into the land. Hence why there was a generation that had to be transitioned and the next generation was ready, right? And the sages talk about this. <clears throat> and they even ask about the temple. But the temple, you know, some people say, oh, it looks like there was a, there, there were temple practices in Egypt. They were just copying that. No, maybe that was being sanitized and that was kind of the transitional element that they needed to bridge 
where they needed to go. I'm talking about the tabernacle. I'm sorry, into the temple. Yeah. You get what yeah. I'm saying. The same is true of, of the non-Jewish world. You can't take them out of the pagan world and expect them to come to monotheism. You see how it doesn't work very well in the New Testament. Every letter of Paul is some problem. They're reverting back to some practice that they did before. It's a real difficult transition. Mm. So in order to get people where they need to be by the end of the redemption, for when every, because every, if, if everyone's not redeemed, then no one gets redeemed, right? Redemption is a worldwide thing. <clears throat> in yeah. order for that to happen, there's a very long transition that has to happen. And the Mashiach ben Yosef force is active in that. It's a restorative force. It's a salvational force. It's it's moving you from something into where you need to be for the kingdom. And in the book from the Vilna Gaon, um, his teachings written by his, his student and released hundreds of years later, because this again is a very hidden document. I think it was released in 1926, just to tell you how recent that was in time. <laughs> That these have become available to us. The book is called Kol Hator, um, the voice of the turtle dove. It says this: <clears throat> Joseph recognizes is, is not recognized by his brothers, right? But he recognizes them, and he goes on to say, "This is one of the traits." Uh, this he, so again, he's quoting from Genesis. He's quoting from the story of, of Joseph, who recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him because what? He looks like a non-Jew. He looks like the last person on earth who would be their brother. The, uh, the Vilna Gaon says, this is one of the traits of Mashiach ben Yosef, not only in his generation, but in every generation. Because Mashiach ben Yosef recognizes his brothers and they don't recognize him. So there's this idea that they're, okay, we're not going to, we're not exactly going to see this. It's not going to be very clear to us. And here's why it matters. Here's why it's so important. Everything that happens with Mashiach ben Yosef is... Is teaching Torah to the nations on one hand, restoring the nations, paving the way, just like Joseph saved the nations before he even met his brothers again later, right? The nations were being saved for quite a long time from the famine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same way too, Mashiach ben Yosef is going to go out, as Rob Ginsburg said, and he's going to be oriented to the nations, and his brothers aren't going to know that's Joseph until much later in the story, much mm -hmm. later in time. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, Mitch, because this is one of those areas historically you can't deny. If it weren't for the misunderstandings, and we should take some time and talk about that, of Yeshua, Jesus being a new religion, which then became Christianity, which then became a kind of monotheistic, a monotheistic religion with some problems, there right. wouldn't have been a force to combat the pagan stronghold in the Roman Empire. And for the next few hundred years, Christians, emerging Christians, Gentile Christians, and the pagan world would battle until Christianity emerged. And we look back at history and a good part of the world today, I can't say most, I don't know what the numbers would be, but a good part of the world is either monotheistic or heavily influenced by monotheism simply because of the New Testament. Even Islam comes from a it's an outworking of jewish faith which reaches a different audience which also is not kosher torah judaism but it, it's enough of a foundation that a redemptive level can be put on top of it now it has Very to be cleaned simply, up yeah. yeah but if it weren't for that misunderstanding and the detour which became a new religion <laughs> right where would we be today exactly that's a very great, great question, James, that I have had to, uh, I think, in the last decade really struggle with or try to come to a better understanding. Because as you read, um, as you read through the New Testament, um, you tend to, especially when you get into the letters and or you get away from the Gospels, but you get more more into the letters that are the foundational pieces a lot of times for the understanding of the religion of Christianity. Okay. Uh, because it doesn't come from the gospels. And when I say the religion of Christianity, I mean, like you said, where it veered off. And I think the rub, you know, the rub when it happened to cause that veering 
was so difficult to um, to those, you know, especially to the pagans, because they're sitting there going, you know, where was this supposed or for anyone for that matter is where was this supposed to become a new religion? And even the early, I guess you would call Christians were mm -hmm. still in that mindset, you know, as a subsect of, 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 of what, you know, what they had been of what their ancestors, relatives and so forth had understood but now the rub was so difficult to take it out of its, you know, out of, to to disengage the roots from it. Yeah. And with that, that's where it became so difficult for the people on the outside looking back because they knew they knew what they were looking at when they looked at Judaism. And they knew what they looked at when they were, were you know, when they saw that faith. They knew what they were looking at if they saw other sects of that faith. Yeah. And to them, a lot of this was, you know, a lot of times was looking at a subsect of Judaism until it just got to the point where <laughs> it had it had to go. Otherwise, it would, you know, it would be pulled back in. And 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 the, the question I always think about is, is and didn't come to me until later. In, in in my own personal thinkings and, and studying is is that whole aspect of reading the gospels of of, of, of talking about Yeshua and and specifically talking about his the way you know the way he talked the way he the way he was um there was nothing in there nothing that alluded to a fork in the road yeah. and yet when you hit you hit the letters you know that's what a lot of people base that fork on and the rub is just so i mean it's either you go left or you go right and to come into the center of that which is where i think a lot of i guess you would say pagans or those that are on the outside looking back in it's difficult for them to grasp or to understand um and, and and having discussions with people about just but and I don't, I don't mean to get off onto to this side trail but Christians are always saying you know you know Jesus is Jewish and but then it stops there and then the fork happens <laughs> he, he's Jewish but he's not he he he's Jewish but he doesn't act it he's always in contrast yeah. with the temple or he's in contrast with the people that that he deals with and so you know the interpretations the translations the damage that all of that has done over over the the you know the centuries the decades whatnot um just just scatters it everywhere and for someone like myself um having worked through that it was very very difficult in the beginning but then once you <laughs> Once you can kind of set that aside and begin to look at, you know, look at what the rub was and what caused it to veer off like that, then it then it begins to, you know, it, it covers up the gray areas and begins to lighten up that that look a little bit. So I'm not sure if that's exactly where you were headed with the question there, um, but that's uh, that's what you got from me. Yeah. But um, let me let me say this: it's very important to understand. Um, and I'm glad we touched this topic. Um, it's very important to understand that that when we read uh, certain stories, that we don't think of them, and we miss a lot of details because the Bible does not give a lot of background details. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so when when Joseph was in Egypt, what was he doing? Did he forget who he was? Did he forget yes. his faith? Did he forget his people? Um, did he forget God? Never, never once. OK, mm, yeah. but but to be realistic, are we thinking that Joseph was there like a Christian missionary, just making having having people convert and accept, uh, you know, God or, or whatever? You know, the Midrash speaks about it in this way. But how did it work practically? Right. Um, mm -hmm. He 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 must have gave them divine sparks, meaning he he infiltrated them with this wisdom because many do not know this. But Yosef spent time 
in the yeshiva, which is the, the, the learning school, the holy school of Shem and uh, Shem and his and his and and and, um, and Aber. Shem, Shem and Aber. These are these are the old antediluvian patriarchs, sons of sons of Noah, right? And they had a school where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all went. Yeah, they yes. all attended the school, yes. and they learned the holy primordial Torah that was taught to Adam and the subsequent generations of righteous people. The patriarchs went to this school and learned divine wisdom, okay? The, the, the primordial Torah. But so did Yosef. Yosef learned it too from Yaakov and also at this school. So when he would discuss, not everybody in Egypt knew Yosef this way. He was, uh, he was part of the part of the government, right? Um, but but some did come close. As the Midrash says that he circumcised many Egyptians. What does that mean? He must have given them another interpretation, another view of the reality of how the Creator has it. Combating and, de and, and destroying idolatrous beliefs, I'm sure he did that. Or he gave them the sparks, uh, uh, these, these new ideas, so that they be can begin to draw near under the wings of the Creator, right? Yep. Ray, so Ray, let me, this, Ray, yeah, let me ahead, ask you Ray. something, Ray, while you're on that. How does that penetrate the New Testament? How does that, that line of thought for those that may be watching that are still moving at a pace that we were at at one point, how does that penetrate the, the books within the New Testament? And as it's being read, um, if you could just for a second elucidate onto that and what your thoughts are as to how that how that seeps its way down into the New Testament and how important it is that it does. Will do. Will do. So um, that's that's a great question. And so I said all that to say, and and I know people will probably need more background, but I'm not. I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. The fact that Yosef went to the school of Shem and Abram, okay, and Noah, okay, Shem happens to be, according to the Midrash, he happens to be Melchizedek. Melchizedek is this, this the character that Abraham gives ties to, okay? Yeah. He is the first priest, and then the priesthood is given from Melchizedek unto Abraham, and Abraham, from Abraham comes the tribe of Levi, from where the priesthood comes from, right? Sure. But but Shem is a son of Noah, a Noahide. Okay, so this primordial Torah that was for the world at the time is taught yeah. to Yosef, and it yeah. so happens to be that Yosef is sent out to the nations to redeem them. He redeems them too. He helps mm. save them, right, mm. and brings many of them under the wings of the Shekinah, which means to come to the one true God. Yes, in like man, in like man. The teachings of Yeshua, this is incredible. This is divine providence. Yeah. Jesus didn't have a New Testament. The apostles didn't have a New Testament. Right. Paul didn't have a New Testament. None of these, all they had was the Tanakh in Hebrew. And they they got all these teachings that we find in the New Testament from the Tanakh. Nowhere else. They didn't have a, a New Testament that they were writing these things from. It's from there. And yeah. these writings, even according to the church fathers, a few of them, maybe the first gospels, were only found in Hebrew. Amazing. The church fathers say this. But then they began to be translated into other languages, Greek, etc., for the communities of Jews that were probably in the diaspora and the non-Jews who were coming into this faith in the yes. beginning. In the beginning. But this is way after the apostles had died. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is how you begin to see the question that you're asking me. And it's very incredible. Check this out. Who writes most of the books that we know today that are in this one book called the New Testament? Who has written the most books? Yes. Paul. Who is it? Yes, Paul. It's Paul. Mm -hmm. Whose mission is Paul to? The Jews or the yes. non-Jews? Exactly. Who is it yeah. to? Non-Jew. Non -Jew, but, but at the non-Jewish world, here's yes. this person. Here's this Pharisee who is a disciple, uh, who is a, a follower. Of this person, Yeshua ben Yosef, a rabbi, right. and he's pro he's promulgating these teachings, these holy teachings, to the non-Jewish world, right? Much like Yosef, right? 
But at least, right. at least Yeshua has an emissary. He's teaching all these non-Jews these things, and he he is geared just like Yosef, who went to the school of Shem, who was the son of Noah, teaching the, these guidelines to the world. So you have here Yeshua and his teachings being brought down by one of his apostles, one of his uh, followers, geared to the non-Jews only. Yes. Even translated in a language that they can understand, even using yeah. concepts that they can understand, much like Joseph couldn't speak to the Egyptians like a Hebrew with yeah. the Hebrew culture. He had to speak to them on their on their way, in their term, in their language, how they could understand. Right, right. These, and, are, these are all connections. And Egypt at the time of Joseph. So that's the thing I think our, some people in the audience may be struggling with. We're talking about this on a shot level, which is the plain reading of the text. And then we're talking on a midrashic level, which is the homiletic kind of back legend yes, of, of it. Yes. We're talking about it on the sold level, which is the mystical spiritual. And then we're also adding in a level of historical, which we've observed yes. in our vantage point downstream. At the time of Joseph, Egypt was the epicenter of idolatry, right? Yes. Which is what Passover is all about. It's Every one of those plagues is an attack on on an um, an idol, one of the chief deities within. Even the lamb was a deity in um, in those days. The and Nile Moses, River, yeah. yep, the Nile. So all of these things are at the epicenter of of idolatry in the world, and it was the the place where all the nations were coming and going, which is why Joseph had to go there to combat idolatry, paganism in that time, to pave a way for the the Jewish people, what would become the Jewish people, the, the sons of Jacob. In the time of the second temple period, or after the second temple period specifically, the Roman Empire was the epicenter of idolatry. And it was moving, and it was it was growing. And in order to stop that, that's what we're saying is the spiritual entity now, the spiritual force, which is manifested, you could say, in the work and the teachings of uh, Yeshua, uh, ben Yosef, right, is now becoming the very chief entity that is turning the, the tide of idolatry. And it's interesting because now I'm going to go back. The sages talk about Rachel. Rachel is the mother of Joseph. And when Rachel was leaving Laban's house, she stole one of his idols and he came to find it and she sat on it. And in the Midrash, it says that because Rachel sat on that idol, her it's 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 a precursor to the idea that that um, the ten tribes are going to struggle with idolatry. They're going to struggle with it in a way that Judah doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And we see, of course, mm -hmm. historically that played out, and it's recorded. Mm. That's this why... is one of the qualities. This is one of the qualities, according to the Kabbalists, that Mashiach ben Yosef in every generation is supposed to come back in battle of Odazara idolatry. Exactly, and wow. so that's the point. So. It's not accidental. Again, there's another non-accidental um, historical reality that this Mashiach ben Yosef movement attacks Rome and starts turning over all of these people towards some kind of like shaky transitional monotheistic monotheism. thing. Now, it, is there a bad history between Christians and Jews? Yes. Have there been pogroms in the Holocaust and, and many things between? Absolutely, right? Crusades, we could, we've done that episode before. We did two episodes last season on that. Yep. Um, yep. But divine providence would say all of that was somehow part of the <clears throat> plan. All of yep. that was what was necessary to transit a thoroughly pagan world to a thoroughly almost majority, if not majority, monotheistic ish world right need some cleanup but now we have shows and i don't i don't i'm not an, i'm not endorsing the show but it's an amazing thing to see the show like the chosen 10 years ago you would have this would have been laughed out of here right or however mm -hmm. go back a few years the whole idea would have been dismissed does it have problems is it accurate that's for someone else to decide we're not talking about it but the fact that now people are changing the name Jesus with Yeshua and they're recognizing that this person is now Jewish and even some Jews are recognizing. I said this, I think, in an episode ago 
Um, I know of an Orthodox Jew who said, yeah, nobody has a problem with, with, uh, with Jesus. And he, it's Paul, right? So there's already a turn of yeah. perspective. Yes. And it's coming from both sides. Yes. But it had to go the route that it did hmm. because of divine providence. And because, you know, that's honestly the only way to, to make that transition. Wow. And, you know, when, when we go back to, I want to, this is the verse Ray and I were looking at, and then I'll hand it over to him. Genesis 45, um, 5, 6, and 7, kind of spell this out for us. <clears throat> and it goes like this. He's talking to his brothers, and they're shocked because they realized that's Joseph. This entire time, that guy who's been giving us the runaround, making us go back, right, and come back with our brother and tell our dad and like threatening to kill us because we were stealing things or making our lives miserable. That's Joseph. They're terrified because he has power and they didn't realize who they were talking to. Okay, so verse five, it says, now Joseph's talking to them, don't be distressed or reproach yourselves because you sold me here. It was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. So we see in the in the language, it's a general saving of life. <clears throat> it's not specific to the nation of Israel. It's a general God sent me here to save life, right? Mm -hmm. So as I'm mm -hmm. saying this, I want you to have like the rabbinic mindset. I want you to look at this on all the levels. Look at it on the level of Joseph talking to his brothers, what happened at that time. But also look at it in the sense of how it unfolds in history through the interface of the New Testament, if, if that's helpful. So he, God sent me here. Don't be upset. He did it to save life, life, life of the nation. <laughs> then he says... It's now two years that there's been a famine in the land, and there are still five years to come, which there will be no yield from tilling. So he tells them, only a few years have passed. It's going to be a longer time, right? We still have a lot more to go. Call right. it exile. Call it famine. Call it darkness, whatever. Then he follows up in verse 7 again, which is weird. Why would he say this twice? <clears throat> but he says, God sent me ahead of you to ensure your survival on earth and to save your lives in an extraordinary deliverance. So we have saving of lives, but we have some more time to go for your deliverance. Now he's talking specifically for the nation of Israel. And, you know, when you think about that, you look at what Paul says, don't be wise in your own sight, Gentiles. I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, a partial hardening, darkening, if you will, in some language, some translations, concealment. Has come, right, concealment has come upon Israel mm. until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this mm. way, all Israel will be crazy. Saved. Crazy. Again, are we looking at an accident or are we looking at a, a continuous tradition that has manifested itself in history? Like we're looking at, we have the vantage point thousands of years later to say, hey, it was there all along. The, the, the words were there. Have we recognized God's hand in it? Have we have we accepted that even though it's messy, this is the way God was working the world towards the redemption of which we're on the edge of, right? Incredible. Incredible. I mean, um it's it's crazy to see, you know, and, and it's uh amazing, it's fascinating. Um one one thinks about these things and these these connections. Um I was thinking about you know the whole the whole story of Yosef and um you know the position that he rises to and and the position that we know that Yeshua has amongst the nations i mean he's <laughs> i think he in a way he's even beat Yosef because Yosef became viceroy meaning the only one higher than him was was uh pharaoh yeah. And uh, I think that the, the, the Midrashim explained that Pharaoh alludes to God and Yosef is God's vice, viceroy. But <laughs> according to the nations, according to Christianity, Yeshua has risen even all the way to the level of God <laughs> yeah. in this, yeah. in this uh, type, of, type of belief that they have. Yeah. Um, but it... it a lot of these things had to be so. And then, you know, you, you find certain things that Yeshua says in the Gospels that kind of just leave you awestruck when you look at the entire scope of history and, and how it's come down to us. 
um, you know, you, you're forced to say, you know, man, he clearly was deeply involved with the Judaism of his day on, on in every level. There, there's a there's a there's a there's some there's a portion that he says in, in the Gospel of John. He says something very unique. It's, it's interesting. And he says this. He says uh, two things that I, I'll, I'll I'll touch, and don't let me forget. One of them is when Yeshua talks about. He says, "I've only been sent." Listen to this. I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yep. That's so weird, right? Because in the first century, the, the ten tribes in the northern kingdom had already been exiled and gone. I mean, I, I, you can see that Paul Paul knew that he was from the tribe of Benjamin, so there was people who kind of still knew what, yep. what tribe they were from in the first century. But he says, I was only sent to the lost tribe of Israel. So, so the lost sheep of the of the of, of the house of Israel. That's weird, because that the language is weird that he mm. says this, and mm. especially if you tie into what happened historically, Yeshua went out into the exile. He's entrapped in 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 the system of Rome, right? And 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 we have known through historical findings that the the ten tribes have. We think that some people have been over here, and some people are over here, you know. And there's a lot of Moranos and 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 crypto Jews, et cetera, who have some dealing or some connection with Christianity. Yep. Mm -hmm. So number one thing, the other thing I wanted to say is that Yeshua says, and, and it ties back into this, the battle against idolatry. He says in the gospel of John, he says, like, he says, like Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. <laughs> he says, so the son of man shall be lifted up. Yeah. Okay, that's so weird. And I remember reading this midrash that says like this. It says it wasn't the bronze serpent that saved or anything like that. Because if you read according to the Torah, what happened to the bronze serpent is what happened? It became an idolatrous symbol. Mm -hmm. People were worshiping the symbol and there's all kinds of, like, like the cross, other bronze serpents were lifted up and they had to, uh, well, who was it? Hezekiah had to smash it and mm -hmm. break it. You know, he, he had to he had to destroy this symbol because it became a symbol of idolatry. Yep. Yeshua says that just as the son of just as the bronze serpent was lifted up by Moses, so the son of man shall be lifted up, hinting towards, I guess, his death on the cross. And whoever shall believe, you know, whatever shall be saved. The midrash says that it wasn't the bronze serpent that saved anybody, but when people looked with emuna. According to the divine command that people mm -hmm. should look at the bronze serpent, yep. but when they lifted up their eyes to Hashem and believed the command, that they, they were healed. Yep. Emuna. Yeah. It's emuna. The, the main thing is emuna, and this is what we have missed. These are the details that the nations have missed. They they didn't have this connection with Yosef. The nations didn't have this connection with Yosef. There's one person, and even if he had emissaries. The apostles. It's too little bit of people. Paul, he was too little bit of, of a person. But even so, this is incredible. After after we had the situation the schism that we had in the first century between different sect, sect, sects of Judaism, the Pharisees, we were talking about this, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the Essenes, who were also part of the Pharisees at a time, um, the Zealots, the Hasadim, Harishonim, all these different groups, right? After there says that there says that Sinachinam, because of Sinachinam, uh, because the basis hatred amongst the Jews, the temple ended up being destroyed because Sinachinam is 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 uh is like a it's like having it's like having all the three the three cardinal sins that why the first temple was destroyed is combined in Sinachinam. Yep. Murder, idolatry, and sexual immorality, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Yeshua was caught up in this Sinach Hinam, and, and so he was sold to Rome, to the nations who killed him, okay? For and silver. So, uh, for silver, yeah. much like Yosef, right? And so 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. He actually, according to the divine, uh, according to the rule Kakodish, the Holy Spirit, that he had, he had prophesied that this would happen, Okay. Others prophesied it too, but he was one of them. The temple was destroyed, and he fell in 
because of the rift and the schisms that were happening between the Jewish disciples of Yeshua and the Jewish community, there was another split, and these people were excommunicated. We we we, we hear this in the Amidah, you know, the the, the, the Menim, you know, all this the, the situation that was happening, and so we have they excommunicated Jesus and his disciples and anything connected to them, and so Yeshua and his teachings, his essence fell into the hands of the other side, of the Sidracha, which its base is in Edom, in Rome. Rome. Okay? He's exiled there. He went before. Okay? This is incredible. It goes there, and how are the nations ever going to know about God, about monotheism? It is divine providence, my friends. God, Jesus was already dead. His apostles were already dead. So nobody was orchestrating this. This was in the hands of the Gentiles. God made it so that these seeds of holiness, of Kedusha, and these teachings that will be kept there, it's funny. Ariel Konaloro, he teaches that nuts root, that Nazarenes, the Nazarenes, the root of that means to, to keep, to guard. Mm. He says to guard holiness. And and these these people were able to guard and, and, and at least hold these teachings in a way corrupted form. They read it in a corrupted format, never been able mm. to truly understand its essence, but it's helped to moralize the nations. You we were talking earlier, James. Yeah. How were how were how were the na- how were, how was Yiddish guy or Torah able to combat the paganism that was in the world at that time when we're talking about the Vikings and all these different type of pagans that were Christianity did that. Yeah. They took care of a lot of that. Mm. Yeah. Rambam says mm. that Christianity paid, paid the world, taking it in this force of the redemptive process. You know, the nations now know about the Torah, about the one God of Israel, the creator, about the, the concept of the Messiah through, yeah. through this, through this vehicle of Christianity. Because Yiddish guy, the Jews have been so busy just defending and trying to survive yeah. that they've never been really truly been able to be outward in right. their and like outward in it. The, they've always been preserving and looking for the salvation of the Jewish people. And and it's yeah. very hard to do to, to look for the salvation of the world when you're trying to survive, right? Exactly. But what does the Midrash say? The Midrash say the Jewish people were only exiled for what reason, James? Baseless hatred, to not to not. No, no, no. They were they were exiled oh, to do what? Yes. The, the outcome of that is to go spread Torah to the nations and redeem the sparks. Mm-hmm. So. And redeem the sparks and 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 bring bring many to, to the truth. To yep. make converts. There's a there's a midrash that says it, it, to make converts. Yep. Right? And that's that's fascinating. Whether yeah. they want to or not, you're gonna go be a light to the nations wherever you're at. Yeah. Hmm. And you know, to your point, when you when you look at the way this went historically, as we said last episode, um, if Yeshua had lived in a generation later, when Judaism rebooted after the temple was destroyed, when everything was about unity, right? We we see that the the arguments now are they're for the sake of heaven in a different way. That mm-hmm. sectarianism was gone. Everything is about unity. So Yeshua, who told his students to listen to the teachers, uh, who sat on the seat of Moses, the Pharisees, if a generation later he had come, he would have blended right back into that that world. And I think the world, the rest of the world would never even know what the Bible was. Mm-hmm. Idolatry would have continued to spread. It would have just eventually destroyed the Jewish people. Wow. Um, when you think about it, because the Romans and the Greeks both had had enough. Hence why the Jewish people were exiled. If they had blended in, I think idolatry would have just become too big of a problem and there would be no one else fighting that battle to save them. Yet Hashem used the nations and although it brought bloodshed and it brought strife for sure. But through that, through that strange working of the timing of when Yeshua was there and the nations being involved, who doesn't know of the Bible today? Who doesn't quote a verse of, of proverbs yep. or the psalms and they may not know that's where it is or they may not be able to tell you which passage it is to heal them but they say it 
who doesn't have some kind of understanding or, or have a Bible in their house? Every hotel you go to, every hotel you go to, doesn't matter where you go, there might be a um, some form of a Bible in a drawer there, right? How else would that content, how else would the Torah have made its way around the world if not for the strange, um, sometimes destructive, often clumsy uh, working of the last 2,000 years? Mm -hmm. But here we are. And that's the essence of Mashiach ben Yosef. That's the movement. That's what it does. And it does it in a concealed way. And it does it in a way that we don't see it in the moment. Only mm -hmm. when we Amazing. look back on history can we say, yes. oh, wow, look at this. Right? Yes. So in that regard, everything we said tonight isn't very new. But mm. I think we're bringing it to a, a public. Um, and we would love to hear your comments. What do you think of that? You know, comment below if um, if you're on the YouTube channel. Um, we'd love to hear what you think because it's been messy, but do you see it? Do you agree? Do you have a different perspective? We'd love to know. Yeah, I mean, even if even if people even if people disagree with Yeshua being connected to the Messianic concept, you cannot you cannot uh, you cannot you cannot neglect the the connections there. I mean, even the Rambam says that he yeah. says it. He says that Yeshua helped to spread Messianic consciousness and this, that, and the other. And it is only because this is a fact of life. Scholars, various scholars will tell you that monotheism was spread in the way that it was spread because of the vehicle of Christianity, which whether you want to or not, once it's brought back to its essence, mm -hmm. which is the historical and religious context of Jesus and the apostles, they were religious Jews within first century Judaism, period. Anything that happened after that was part of divine providence. You cannot get that stuff that happened about 300 to 400 years later and apply it to those Jews. It's the other way around. And there's one one thing to add to that while I'm thinking about it. So Chabad, Aish, right? These websites, these massive websites which are out there for Jewish knowledge. Aleph Beta, Rabbi Foreman, a Baltimore rabbi, uh, Rabbi Foreman. If you ask any of them who the largest demographic of people who travel to their site are it's not jews and all of them are creating content Aish, aleph beta they're all creating content to handle those issues because it's not the it's not the messianic jews it's not the the jewish believers it's not the secular jews it's the christians who are going to their site these days to learn how to Incredible. interact with the torah so once again, it's not, like I said, it's not the niche Messianic Jews in the middle. It's the Christians who are once again in huge numbers, knocking down the walls, going to the, the, the rabbis and, and saying, hey, show me, show me how to worship God, right? It's prophetic. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. But it just makes me laugh because we're in this space all the time and we're not the ones moving the needle. Well, it's funny that you bring that up, James, because I... I... I have a tendency sometimes on a day like this, I'll flip through YouTube and listen to some, some, some Christian teaching that, but both, both uh, teachings that I listened to today was about the, uh, the church, the decline of the church, yeah. the, um, you know, just, you know, why it's important to get back into the church and how they're seeing such a, a mass exodus um they know why you know i mean if they have any slight bit of intelligence uh or can spend any time studying outside of programming um uh, which is a difficult thing to do if you're you know responsible for paying the bills you know a lot of times programming is is you know can supersede theology but it is what it is. And I think, you know, as we wrap this up tonight, this is an incredible food for thought because you have taken us into a, uh, both of you guys have taken us into this realm of divine providence to how it associates, you, you know, or how can we think about it okay. as it associates <laughs> with issue and with uh you know just what 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 we've learned through our you know our own time that we've spent within that realm 
And I just like you said, James, I, I more and more every day I hear people that are going not just to those sites, but they're asking those questions and they're asking, you know, just, you know, the, and, and, and this is the last thing I'll say, because you talked about the levels of understanding, you know, that that's not that you don't hear that in the Christian world. It's always that. You know, it's what you get told and that's where it kind of stays or what that particular interpretation or translation of that yeah. of that Bible is. But to understand those levels of interpretation, those understand those levels of study is is huge yeah. when you get into, you know, a realm of thinking like this. So thank you guys so much again for just uh, um knocking it out of the park giving us a lot of food for thought a lot to think about this is definitely one of those episodes that you will listen to one time and then you'll go back to the second time and just you'll need you know it's 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 not it's not a three-point sermon that you can just fly through and go well you know that's pretty cool i can you know, the application of that is pretty simple. This is something that requires thought. And that's why within this realm, study is so crucial. So, so crucial. And having, you know, having a good access point for that study. So I just want to thank you guys. Um, either of you have anything you want to add before we close it out? Just for our, our listeners, just to concentrate on the main theme of this topic, which was divine providence. Yes. I mean, there's no other way to look at this outside of the fact that God was behind behind all the movements and everything that has transpired to our yes. very day, to our yes. very day. Yes, very yeah, good, Ray. Th that's a really good practical lesson from all of this. If you don't look up any of these sources and you're not interested in that, take away this idea that everything that happens in life, it is very difficult to apply that in real time, Yes, is divine providence. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Tishbiav, Tishbiav just passed. The That's rabbis right. teach that every time, every year that passes, and the and the temple is not rebuilt, is part of our collective fault. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so we have to try to do our best to 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 make things flow and to make the connections and and to continue to have faith in God and keep His will mm -hmm. and and spread light wherever we can to see that hopefully next year. Or, oh, or, or tomorrow, yes. or today, um, yes. uh, if God willing, Mashiach will come and the redemption will come. Yep. Oh, man. Very good. Well, thank you guys. And, and to both of you, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Have a safe week this week. To those of you out there that listen to us and, and take time, we appreciate each and every one of you. Our prayers and blessings to your families. And we hope uh, to be back soon with a new episode. So take care. And we Hope to be back here in front of you real soon again. Thanks, guys, and have a good evening.